welcome to Blackbriar Gaming. Today, we'll be looking at the fifth legion, the White Scars, the Ordu of Jagatai, in the next video in our How to Build a Legion series. Hopefully, this is useful not only to those interested in the White Scars, but for all Legion players, giving them an understanding of the concepts behind army building in Horus Heresy, and an idea of what each Legion can bring to the table. I hope you enjoy. A quick note before we get into it, a subscribe and a like really helps us reach a bigger audience. So if you enjoy the video, please hit those buttons down below. Also, be sure to check out our affiliate link in the description. The White Scars, the Laughing Killers, the Wild Sons of Chagoras. I've been on a recent lore binge of the White Scars as I plan on making a 5th Legion force for my next army. This How to Build a Legion video is particularly special for me for this reason and because I just love everything about the White Scars. Their lore is beautifully written, their miniatures look fantastic, and right now they're sitting pretty firmly as heresy underdogs. What's not to love? The White Scars came late to the heresy, partly due to the machinations of Horus and the Alpha Legion. On a mission of discovery to determine the truth of the heresy, their legion almost tore itself apart above Prosper Prospero there we go, in a schism that makes the Dark Angels look like the poster boys of loyalty. They've led the traitors throughout the heresy through hit-and-run warfare until they were able to forge a path to Terra, where they are present for the siege. The White Scars ooze with character far beyond their love of jet bikes, so let's get into what building a 5th Legion army looks like. First up, the Age of Darkness box set. The starter set can be a bit hit or miss for the White Scars, depending on which direction you're taking. I'll go into more detail when I discuss the 5th Rights of War, but essentially I see three paths that I would want to take when building this legion. One, the true sons of Chagoras, mounted upon steeds of iron and racing towards the enemy with the wind in their faces. Great stuff. Two, the shamed Sagia Mazen, an infantry heavy force sworn to seek an honourable death to cleanse their souls of dishonour. More great stuff. Or three, Relics of the Star Hunters, Terran-born 5th Legion Astartes, more balanced in their way of warfare, and just a tad too enamoured with the Warmaster. Also, great stuff. So much to work with here. If you're looking at building what is arguably a more traditional White Scars force of jet bikes, land speeders, and other speedy lads, then the Age of Darkness box set may not be the best place to start. Saying that, the Chagorian Brotherhood, the right of war, a bike-heavy army is always taking, actually gives infantry outflank, which is kind of great. And there are no issues with putting a Spartan full of Terminators onto the table to surge forward with the rest of the Ordu. It just comes down to how you want to spend your points, and whether there are enough left over after putting a dozen or more jet bikes onto the table. If you're going down the Sagir Marzen or Terran style path, then the Age of Darkness box set will fit far more naturally to the style of army you'll be building. All units in the box set will see play. While many White Scars players may shy away from Dreadnoughts for narrative reasons, if you're playing a Terran style force, then the aversion to encasing their warriors in walking coffins wouldn't really exist. You can get away with it. Similarly, while 5th Legion players might gravitate towards Tartarus Terminators over Cataphracto for a number of reasons, I simply cannot pass up the White Scores Praetor in Cataphracto armor. Have you seen this guy? He's got to be in my top 10 heresy miniatures. He is just so pretty. In fact, he is currently the only White Scars miniature I own. I, uh, I picked him up while doing an Alpha Legion order because I just couldn't help myself. And if you're like me and are a sucker for good looking minis, then you'll need some other cataphracti stooges to accompany him into battle. The starter set's got you covered. This is a very roundabout way of saying that, yes, the majority of White Scars players could do a lot worse than picking up an Age of Darkness box. In this edition, an army full of nothing but jet bikes is actually going to have a real hard time, so I'd probably recommend getting some infantry into the force no matter what right of war you're going to build. With that done, let's check out the White Scars special rules. I have heard a lot of apathy towards some White Scars special rules out there and have been guilty of underestimating them myself. But I kind of think they might be low-key great. Plus one to your movement doesn't sound like the sexiest Legion special rule in the world, but here's the thing. It applies to every single one of your units. Infantry. Tanks, Dreadnoughts, Cavalry, Artillery, everything. 
In the case of most of your infantry, it's boosting them up to movement 8, which is just enough to get them the plus 1 to charge in the assault phase. So now you're actually getting plus 2 to your movement for most of your infantry if you happen to be charging that turn. Here's where it gets really nice. A White Scar's land raider of any variant goes up to movement 13. When moving at half its speed so that a unit can still embark, cruising speed if you will, I think, uh, it can now move 7 inches, as half numbers are always rounded up in heresy. If you happen to have put a meaty unit of Tartarus Terminators in that Spartan, you're essentially getting plus 3 inches of movement in a turn you charge. Sure, we're talking about a particular circumstance here, but I can't count the amount of times I could have used an extra 3 inches. But I'll be blunt with you, this isn't actually the best part of the White Scar Special Rule. There's a second part that I think a lot of people forget or read over without considering its impact. 5th Legion players get to roll 2 dice when rolling to see who goes first in a game, and if that doesn't work, they get to roll 2 dice to seize the initiative. Now, I did some pretty scientific testing, and I rolled some dice. I rolled this scenario out about 20 or so times, and the White Scars player either got first turn or seized 18 times out of 20. I like those odds. Uh, now, if you actually do the maths behind it, please chuck some stats down in the comments, because I'm not going to. Uh, in fact, it's almost better in, the, in this situation to go second, perfectly counter your opponent's deployment, and then have a semi-decent kind of 1 in 3 chance to seize on them. I don't, I don't hate that. I played a game the other day, uh, you can watch it on our channel in fact, where I got seized on, and I had not prepared for that scenario. As I'm sure many other players don't, uh, it was an absolute disaster. So, how do we build around either going first or seizing the initiative? Decent long-range shooting is the answer here. Reliably going first and being able to knock out your opponent's heavy-hitting shooting units, particularly those at strength 8 and above that can give your jet bikes, if you do go down that route, a hard time, is a solid advantage. Enemy heavy sports squads and whirlwind Scorpio squadrons will be your main enemies here. Assume your opponent has triggered night fighting, uh, and then one of your best options to counter heavy sports squads, depending on your right of war, are larger recon squads that can outrange your opponent's las cannons or missile launchers with their shroud bombs and nemesis bolters. Recon marines are particularly flavorful for Terran Star White Scars armies, as they carry their pioneer tendencies over from being star hunters. Attaching a Master of Signals to get them the night vision in that you know night fighting scenario we're talking about here isn't a terrible choice either. To shut down enemy whirlwinds, which can cheekily hide out of sight, I recommend jet bike squads with multi-melters. Your movement, a mighty 17 inches, will hopefully allow you to have a sneaky peek around any line of sight blocking terrain and get you within that 12 inch sweet spot to activate armor bane on your weapons. As multi-melters are twin linked, you'll still be getting a reliable number of hits in a night fighting scenario too. If the enemy comes after you the next turn, you activate your White Scar's advanced reaction and disappear 17 inches in the opposite direction. That's probably enough on their special rules, you get the idea. Now let's get down to business and talk about their rights of war. One is a whole bunch of fun, and one is potentially completely broken with the current missions we have available. Let's start with that fun one, the Chagorian Brotherhood. So this is exactly what you expect from a right, white Scar's right of war. Jet bikes are doing jet bikes things. Let's have a look. The effects, essentially, uh, Sky Hunter Squadrons and Legion Outriders can be taken as troops, and they get the line unit subtype. Fantastic. You can also take them as elite choices, if you so choose. Lastly, all models with the infantry unit type in a detachment using this right of war gain the outflank special rule. Very nice. Now, the limitations are pretty intense. Essentially, infantry that doesn't begin embarked on a transport or any model with the vehicle unit type that isn't either a transport or fast must begin play in reserves. Secondly, a detachment using this right war may not include any heavy sport or fortification choice unless those choices are entirely composed of models with the flyer subtype. I don't think we have any flying fortifications yet, but geez, wouldn't that be kind of cool? On paper, the right of war sounds fine. Jet bikes as troops that gain line, line is good, fast moving units with line is great. Where we start to hit some snags is that jet bikes just aren't quite as good as they probably should be. In first edition, they were ridiculous. No one's saying we need to go back to that, but at only toughness four with a three plus save and with a hefty points cost, they start to die 
rather quickly if the enemy has the opportunity to focus any decent firepower onto them. So what's the solution? I have seen jet bikes do some absolutely fantastic work in a fire support role. You essentially have to think about them as extremely mobile heavy support squads. The bigger the squad, the more dangerous the reaction. And this is key. If line of sight blocking isn't viable, you want to make sure that at the end of your turn, you're within threat range of whatever unit your opponent is going to want to shoot at you. Jet bikes are one of the few squads that can pack weapons as powerful as multi-melters or Volkite culverins, position themselves advantageously on the battlefield within their turn, and then still get a reaction. A squad of three jet bikes returning fire in your opponent's turn isn't much of a threat. A squad of eight jet bikes returning fire is a nightmare. Enemy heavy sports squads and vehicles are going to think twice about firing at them if the return fire promises to wipe them out. Okay, that's some 101 jet bike theory. Let's look at the other parts of this right of war. Ironically enough, all infantry gaining, gaining outflank is probably the most powerful part of this right of war. Always remember that dedicated transports also gain outflank. Even the threat of a bunch of tanks and infantry outflanking on turn 2 or 3 can put serious pressure on an opponent and alter their game plan. While you can certainly assault out of outflank, opponents will often move as far away from your well, one of two, right? They're either going to move far away from your signposted entry point as they can, uh, or they're going to try and wrap you around. Now, if they're of the moving away variety, I find that mid-range shooting units perform best. A tactical support squad with Volkrite calibers or plasma guns riding in a rhino have a very decent threat range, especially once we factor in the extra movement of the white scars. Back into that assault piece though. Assault squads and destroyer assault squads also make prime outflanking units. Candy opponents, as I said, may attempt to surround and close off your outflanking entry points. Units with jump packs can move over those squads without any issues and have a very decent assault threat range without having to pay the points for a land raider. The limitations on this right of war are pretty intense. Having some infantry on the board at the beginning of the game in transports, certainly worthwhile. Land raiders are not only intensely more durable than rhinos, but also provide great line of sight blocking for your squishy jet bike units. It also gives your opponent a tough choice. The weapons that are best against jet bikes are also probably the ones they want to be shooting at your vehicles. Only being able to take a heavy support choice with the flyer subtype is also a brutal limitation. The Fire Raptor honestly just falls a bit flat in the current state of the game without the ability to meaningfully impact heavy armor or units with a 2 plus save. Xiphon Interceptors, however, are a wonderful choice and a better choice every single time especially because your fast attack slots are wide open with jet bikes being troops or elite. Other fast attack options include either of the land speeder variants, including the white scar specific, here we go, Kizagun, Kizagun? Doesn't sound great, Zagan, Kizagun, mm -hmm. assault speeder. Cost effective ways to get, <laughs> assault speeder. Cost effective ways to get some extra firepower onto the table and provide target saturation for a jet bike heavy army. If you've taken the Born to the Saddle Warlord trait, your land speeders are also gaining the benefits, ignoring difficult terrain and getting a save against dangerous terrain. So we've got some long range firepower jet bikes, some outflanking infantry with jump packs, some outflanking infantry with mid range firepower, a couple of land raiders starting on the table filled with terminators and or Eben Kashig, don't forget those boys, and perhaps a couple of Xiphon interceptors. To finish out this force, I'd probably be looking at some Golden Kashig, because they're great, and a Praetoron jet bike with a similarly mounted Command Squad. Jet bikes with weapon skill 5 and 2 plus saves do far better on Heresy Battlefields, and I just can't help but take some. Unfortunately, if you're running Golden Kashig, you either need a Chaff unit to charge in before them to deal with the inevitable hold the line reaction, or a Telepathy Librarian or Stormseer to reliably shut the reactions down. And I have put a bit of a ban on myself from taking Telepathy Librarians. As much as people may like to suggest otherwise, the way the rules are written, the Golden Kashig's Contos, Contos? Hmm. Power Lancers cannot be used against an opponent who has successfully held the line against their charge. They just can't. It's an absolute pain, but something to keep in mind. GW, if you're listening, Please sort that out. Okay, that is the first right of war sorted. Not the easiest right of war to run, but certainly an interesting one. 
Next up, we have the Sagia Marzon. What a rock show this one is. Let's have a look. All right, the effects. Eben, Kashig, maybe taken as trip choices. Sure. Here we go. All units that are infantry are given the Karesh and the Feel No Pain special rules. Mm -hmm. Feel No Pain 5 plus. And all models uh, with Legionis of Studies and Karesh special rules in a detachment gain the Feeler special rule for the duration of any assault phase in which they make a successful charge. An army in which any detachments using this right of war may not choose to place any units in reserve, so you can't do deep strikes, subterranean assaults, or flanking assaults. And a detachment using this right of war may not include any heavy support that are not composed entirely of models with the infantry unit type. Or any fortification or Primark. Ooh, no, no Primarchs. There we go. So there is there is so much going on here. Evan Kashyyyk, uh, Kashyyyk as troops is probably the least exciting part, honestly. The unit is fine, but they're just fine, especially when all infantry in your army have access to their most useful trait, which is, of course, the Koresh special rule. They are, however, stuff in 10. But this also becomes less important when you factor in a certain White Scars Warlord trait that we'll discuss a bit later on. And remember, even though they're troops, they don't gain line. So, meh. Now, giving all infantry Feel No Pain 5 Plus is fantastic. There is so much value here. It's essentially like giving every infantry unit a free apothecary, except that this is better because your feel no pain can't be taken away by your apothecary getting sniped off the board by precision shots. To get the most value out of all this bonus feel no pain, you're going to want to include some long range firepower in your army to pick off enemy units with strength eight, strength eight or higher weaponry. We're seeing a theme, aren't we? Because of course, when it doubles out your toughness, instant death, you can't take feel no pain saves. Luckily, the Saki Mazen Rite of War has zero problems with you taking recon squads and heavy sports squads, who, of course, are better than their non-white scar counterparts with Feel No Pain and the Koresh Special Rule. Let's talk about that. Koresh Special Rule essentially means that when uh, they, one of the infantry squads dies, or one of the squads with the Koresh Special Rule, which are going to be infantry in this case, uh, when that squad dies, it cannot give victory points to your opponent. Not letting your opponent score any victory points for killing infantry is just insane. Infantry is king in 2nd edition heresy, so you'll have no issues with creating a very solid force of just infantry if you really want to push home the point. It instantly shuts down secondary objectives such as Slay the Warlord and Attrition. It makes Blood Feud a completely unwinnable for your opponent and impacts the primary objectives of Onslaught and War of Lies. When building a Sagia Marzon list, I would actually suggest you include a tank or two, maybe a jet bike unit, perhaps a dreadnought, just to avoid a potentially auto win situation. Self-regulation is important in this situation. But what does this army look like on the table? The options are honestly endless. So many amazing units benefit from the effects of the right of war that you can build the army however you like. There's so much flavor to this right of war. Read into some of the White Scars lore around the Sagi Marzan and, and just let that inspire you. Eben Kashig may seem like an obvious option just from a narrative standpoint, but benefit not at all from the amazing rules of the Rite of War, because they already have them and you're paying the points. Meaty infantry units are a much better choice in this case to get the most bang for your buck. Most of the White Scars that attempted to side with the Warmaster were Terran born veterans many who had learned their way of war from the Sons of Horus. From a law perspective, you're encouraged to include units such as Breaches, Heavy Support Squads, Dreadnoughts. Gaining Fearless on the charge will have niche uses and is probably best for squads you want to use to hold up your opponent's elite assaults. So you need to have enough bodies to survive a single round of combat, but be cheap enough to comfortably lose. Uh, so, the spoiler squads fit the bill nicely here and are also nice and fluffy for that ex Star Hunter, Sons of Horus loving vibe. To keep all that infantry moving in the right direction, and because losing your infantry warlord doesn't score your opponent any victory points, taking the Heroes Never Die Warlord trait on a jump pack equipped Delegatus is an excellent option. Essentially, when your warlord dies, every unit that can draw light of sight to him gains fearless for the remainder of the battle. Fly this guy up the table, get into combat with a Dreadnought or enemy Praetor ASAP, hopefully do a little bit of damage, and your whole army, once he gets 
clob it into the ground, now has feelers, as long as they can see it when it happens. Fast moving infantry that don't give your opponent any victory points at all when they die, it's just, it's so nice. Wild stuff. A few spicy picks uh, beyond the regular blocks of Marines include Legion Rapier Batteries, who are in fact infantry and benefit greatly from an extra inch of movement and feel no pain on their Toughness 5 Rapier Carriers. Seeker Squads too are pretty fantastic. Keep them nice and cheap by sticking with the stock standard crack and bolters and do some of that mid-range firepower that we were talking about before. As you can't deep strike or pull off any other deployment shenanigans, having some infantry that can infiltrate and cause issues for your opponent turn one is certainly advantageous. Recon squads armed with melter bombs can cause some serious issues for your opponent. With eight inches of movement in a white scars army, feel no pain, feel no pain five plus due to the right of war and then fearless from your sacrificial warlord, sacrificial warlord, suddenly a small squad can be a real thorn in your opponent's side. And if they die, no one cares. Put the fear of the Emperor into traitor vehicles and even make Dreadnoughts think twice before engaging them in combat. As I plan my own White Scars army, I am so utterly torn between these two kinds of builds. In the end, I might go for something in the middle that can be played with either Rite of War, depending on whether I'm looking to play something a bit fun but softer, or a rock hard infantry heavy list that punishes your opponent for daring to try and score any victory points. Now, if you're looking to build out that third style of White Scars Army, something a bit more focused on the Terran veterans, operating much as they did while under the banner of the Star Hunters, you could probably look nice and close at the Recon Company Rite of War. Select the traitor-only Forgotten Sons Warlord trait, ally them with some Sons of Horus for some narrative-fueled adventures, and just have a great time. I won't go deep into this option as I've already talked so much, and I'm sure you can work it out yourself. Recon, Recon and Nemesis Bolters, it's a match made in heaven. Now there's not too much to talk about when it comes to the White Scars armory or characters. Cyberhawks are kind of fantastic and could see play in plenty of units. While Shamshir jet bikes and their scatter launchers will give your opponent a nasty surprise the first time you fire them, but will then have diminishing effects as they use their movement reactions to get the hell away from them. The Stormseer's Saki powers are unfortunately a bit hit or miss with the call of the wind requiring you to awkwardly remain stationary if you want to cast it. But if you build your army around it, putting your Stormseer in a mid-range shooting unit and catapulting a bunch of units up the table, it can do serious work. Lastly, Quinzar, Kinzar, mm, Master of the Kashig, has the wonderful ability to bring on a deep strike or outflanking assault on the turn of your choosing, or delay it if, uh, if you want to go down that route. With the amount of times I've rolled a one or a two to bring on my deep strike assault in turn two, this is definitely something I'll be looking at very closely in a Chagorian Brotherhood style army. Finally, I've put together a 2000 point list for a Sagia Marzen army. I've chosen Sagia Marzen style force as it's by far the most powerful of the two rights of war and also makes better use of the Age of Darkness box set. So for the headquarters, I've gone with a Delegatus console. I've chucked a jump pack on him, kept him nice and cheap with a chartable weapon. I did consider a thunder hammer, but it's an extra 20 points that I kind of didn't want to spend here. And I've given him the heroes never die warlord trait. Why did I not want to spend the 20 points? Because I'm kind of planning on sending him up solo, maybe using some light line of sight blocking terrain and just getting him into combat as soon as possible to do some work but inevitably die and give everyone that can see him fearless. Hopefully, probably turn two is when you want him getting uh, getting his head smashed in. For the other HQ choice, I've gone with a chaplain in Tartarus Terminator armor with a power glaive. Now, when I originally, this list, I've actually rewritten it a few times. This was the hardest list, I, list I've written so far. Uh, I did have him in Cataphract Die Terminator armor and same, same, the Terminator squad in the elites. I originally had that in the Cataphract Die Terminator armor because I was trying to take advantage of the Age of Darkness box set. But that was when I was also planning on chucking them in a Spartan. I played around with that list. It was okay. But I found that by taking out the Spartan and putting them down to Tartarus, which means they can run at initiative five from the chaplain there and therefore don't really need a transport vehicle, I just saved so many points and was able to do way cooler stuff. So I've gone with Tartarus, but of course, if you want to use the Age of Darkness box set, do feel free uh, to go Cataphracti in, the, in their place. Now, so the, the chaplain, I've just given him a power glaive, nothing too special. He's really there 
uh, for giving out hatred and stubborn leadership 10 until your fearless pops off. Now in the elite section, we've got that Tartarus Terminator squad that I talked about. Just seven of them with five power axes and a couple of chain fists. I've said this before, I always like to include a couple of cheeky chain fists in my units just in case I run into a land raider. Next up in the elite slot, we've got a Legion Contempted Dreadnought as this is a Sagia Marzen list. Uh, they don't have as much of an aversion towards Dreadnoughts as a Chagorian Brotherhood list might. Uh, in this case, Gravis Melt Cannon, it's my go-to, but kept him nice and cheap uh, for his power fist. Golden Kashig uh, make up the elites. As I said before, I could very much make this just an all infantry list and just have it be utterly abusive on the table. I wouldn't want to do that to opponents. I wouldn't want to make those kind of situations so miserable for them that they can't, they literally can't win a game. Uh, so instead, I, I've got some uh, I've got some other units in here other than infantry. So Golden Kashig, I think they're really great. Love them in an assault army. They are, they pretty much pile on in after you've assaulted with something else and just, just target something, target something in a, like a dreadnought maybe, and just absolutely blow it off the table. Their weapons are so good and they're so much fun and they look fantastic. Lastly, in the elite slot, I've gone for a couple of Legion Rapier Batteries. As I said, uh, these are laser destroyers. Uh, as I said before, these with the extra movement and the feel no pain on Toughness 5, they just, they're so much harder and so much more maneuverable than their non-White Scars variants. And uh, because they're infantry, it gets all the rules you'd want within this right of war. Then we get onto troops. I've got two units here of Despoilers, 15 strong, Bunch of power axes, sergeants with a power sword and power fist. I think these guys are kind of great. I think the spoilers are really underrated. It can be difficult slogging them across the board, but that extra inch of movement and that extra inch of movement in the assault phase, it's going to help. Uh, these guys are going to be faster than pretty much any other Legion spoilers. Uh, so they're going to get across the board faster, get into combat where you want them. Then we look at a Legion Recon Squad. I've given these guys Melter Bombs. My plan is to infiltrate them and have them just absolutely terrify your opponent with, uh, with what you're gonna do with them and try and hunt down some enemy vehicles. In the fast attack, we've got a big beefy Legion Sky Hunter Squadron, eight jet bikes, all with multi-melters, Sergeant with Artifice Armor, which is a must. I must say, uh, these guys are so great. This is your real Terminator killing squad. So these guys are gonna hunt Land Raiders, they're gonna hunt Terminators, and they're going to just be a real pain. Once again, it's all about the reaction. You want to make them big enough and scary enough that your opponent simply doesn't want to shoot at them. Lastly, in the Heavy Sports Squad, I've got a eight strong unit with a Volkite Culverins. I am, I have become a real fan of Volkite Culverins recently. I think they're just fantastic. Uh, they are good against so many different types of opponents and they just put out so many shots. They are terrifying, really love them. E and even when you only have a few of them left, there's still so many shots going in there that with a bit of variance on your side, they can still do some work. And that comes in at 1,991 points of White Scar goodness. And so ends our discussion on the White Scars. I think the 5th Legion is seriously underrated, both by the community and, honestly, by myself in the past. As I read about them more and more, both from a rules and law perspective, I can't help but be absolutely enamored by their unique nature. There's so many interesting ways you can build a White Scars army. Certainly, the previous edition or tactic of max jet bikes, well, honestly, it's no longer viable, but that doesn't mean the army doesn't have some wonderful list building synergies, as well as some sneaky tricks it can pull off on the battlefield. Thank you for watching, and most importantly of all, make sure to keep rolling those dice and getting hyped for heresy.